Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, to have Yuanji Li uh, from Princeton here today. Yuanji is a student of uh, Sanjeev Arora uh, and has worked on uh, wonderful learning theoretic problems like Bennett convex optimization, uh, efficient approximations of PC and, and, uh, and uh, SVD. And today uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, some issues in uh, low rank approximation of matrices, right? Or uh, matrices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so I guess this talk will be pretty philosophical as usual. So uh, let's just get started. Uh, so I will start with a very broad uh, introduction uh, about machine learning. Uh, so a typical way of doing machine learning is as follows. So first of all, you choose a model, uh, or you choose a hypothesis class, a proper hypothesis class. And I will call this one the modeling part. And then you will and then after choosing the hypothesis class, you get uh, some data. You get some data, and then you find the empirical risk minimization. So you do a ERM process, which means that you find the parameter of that model, or you find uh, some function in this hypothesis class that minimize the empirical risk. So I call this step the optimization. Okay, so what is a classical way of doing this process? So uh, previously, what people discovered uh, is that the first step, you want to choose the hypothesis class to be something very proper. You want to find a small hypothesis class that contain maybe a few functions or a few family of functions. So it's easy to optimize and easy to generalize. So the first step is you want to choose uh, the hypothesis class to be something small. OK, uh, there are a few uh, very successful measurements of how small the hypothesis class is. For example, you want the hypothesis class will be have bounded VC dimension. Or you want the hypothesis class will be bounded uh, right marker complexity. Uh, I don't know if I spell it correctly, probably wrongly. So let's say the measurement is M. And you, after finding the proper hypothesis class that has a bounded capacity or bounded parameter or something, then you find then you you are going to use a lot of data. For the yeah, for the empirical risk minimization problem. Okay, which means usually if you shoot for epsilon arrow, uh, you are going to use m over epsilon square data. This is a standard bound you will get from VC dimension or right marker complexity. So, so this is a classical way to do machine learning. It's like you find a hypothesis class like linear classifiers or neuronized with bounded weights or something that has a small VC dimension or right marker complexity or capacity, any reasonable capacity measure. And then you use a lot of data. So you use uh, the number of data is much larger than the total capacity of the model. And then you train it, you get a good generalization. OK, so in this model, there is a good thing that you can use a classical theory to prove that if you have a ERM generalized, if you have something that has a small empirical risk, uh, empirical error, then you are going to generalize. 
So in this way, if you uh, use this process, then the generalization is very good. But there are also the bad part, which is the training might be very difficult. So how to get an empirical risk minimizer? How to, how to find a good parameter or find a good function in the hypothesis class, such as a training error is small. The problem is usually highly non-convex and uh, in the modern machine learning, so the training might be very difficult. So what turns out is that there is a new way to do machine learning that switched the role of these two things. So what people do now is something completely different from the old theory, is that they want to choose the hypothesis class Uh, choose the hypothesis class to be large. So the hypothesis class might have like VC dimension, uh, something let's call it a, a circle of M, which is much larger than that thing. So the hypothesis class can be a very huge neural network or anything that is extremely large. And then they will use a small amount of sample to do the empirical risk minimizer. So they want to sample a small number of data. So you see, this is a, a switched version of the old process where you have a small hypothesis class and you have a lot of data. Now you have a huge hypothesis class, and you will, you're going to use a small number of data to train the ERM. OK? So uh, by small, I mean this is much smaller than the capacity M of the hypothesis class. So the total number of sample is even much smaller than the capacity of the hypothesis class. For example, you have something of VC dimension M, so you only use like 0.01 M data to train it. So what's a good thing about doing this process is that usually if you uh, use this uh, huge model, then it's much easier to find a very good empirical risk minimizer. So the minimization process is going to be much easier. So using this process, you exactly switch the role of the old thing, which is now the training is very easy. But the generalization is very questionable. Because you have less data than the, than the capacity of your hypothesis class, so how can this thing even generalize? I mean, you, for example, if you train a linear classifier with uh, less uh, number of data points and the uh, hidden dimensions, then of course, you will go into get multiple solutions as an optimizer, and some of them might not have any uh, generalization guarantee. So just to give you a simple example, Tell me, like, the training is hard in the previous thing, and you said training is easy. It completely switches my, what my understanding of, like, the previous literature and the modern, like, neural network literature. So can you give an example? Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm just going yeah. to give a few examples. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, before giving the example, can I just continue for a while? And I will get back to the example slit. OK, so. This is my focus of the talk, which is a new way of training, of doing machine, uh, of, of the training and the modeling process. And usually people call this over parameterization. So this is uh, over parameterization just simply means you have more parameters or capacity or VC dimensional, whatever 
uh, good measurements than the training example. Okay, so the oral parameterization completely changed uh, in old theory or, or the classical theory of machine learning where you have a VC dimension and you have good generalization. So over parameterization, you have more capacity than the data. So the old theorem says nothing about generalization. So uh, in the classical theorem, even if you train the model, it's meaningless. You find a good empirical risk minimizer, then it, it doesn't say anything. But actually, it says something. Uh, but before uh, going to the good part, let's see why the over-parameterization can lead to a very bad generalization. So let's just uh, take a first uh, simple example, uh, which is very simple. So you just want to do linear regression. OK, so what is the old way? So the previous way, you are going to minimize y minus a times x uh, to norm square over the prediction x. So you get uh, uh, the label vector y and the data matrix a. And the previously, the y is something very long. And a is something very tall. and uh, y is something very tall, and A is something very tall, but very uh, narrow, and X is something like this. So if you minimize this, you get a unique, so if A is degenerate, then you get a unique solution of X, and this will generalize if your Y is tall enough. But what is a new way of training this model? So you still minimize uh, y minus a times x to norm square. But now the row is completely different. So you have a very small y, and then you have a very long a, and then you have a very tall x. Okay? So you minimize the uh, two norm of this in square. And of course, uh, of course, you will get a lot of x that has a zero empirical risk uh, error. So uh, as long as A is degenerate, uh, your Y should be in the spine, the column spine of A. So you can find X with a zero empirical risk. Uh, so you, have, you can find X with zero training error. So in the new way, so it's easy to find X uh, such that so y minus a times x is actually equal to 0. But why is the x meaningful? I mean, I have uh, so many parameters in my observation. So why my x actually make sense? Uh, the answer is, in general, the x shouldn't make sense. So let's say uh, we have a, so let's say we have a generative model. Uh, that is, the label is given by some uh, data, inner product of data and the ground truth predictor, x star. And so I know that my y is actually equal to a times x star. But my x can be anything that is equal to x star plus some x theta where the x theta just need to be, just need to satisfy that ai times x theta is equal to zero for all i. So, which means uh, this is one ai. So if the, if the x theta is in the null spine of a, then of course the uh, x star plus x theta is going to be a valid solution with zero training error for this problem. And I can let even let x theta to go to infinity, 
And if I get a new data that is different from the AI there, then I will going to have infinite prediction error. So it, so in this says that general X should not generalize. Okay. But why people still use this uh, model in practice? I, since uh, even if I have a global optimum, I have zero training error, then, but it doesn't say anything about how my test error will be, how the generalization will be. It can be infinitely bad, even for the simple model like linear regression. Uh, So here is, a, here is a new thing about uh, over parameterization. Uh, the way I view it, I view over parameterization is a combination of optimization and modeling. So it's uh, actually work as an intermediate step between the two important parts of machine learning, which is how do you model the problem and how do you train the, or how do you train the model. This thing, these two things are all very important in over parameterization. Otherwise, even in the simple linear regression model, you will not get any generalization. So what do I mean is, if you want to have a good generalization in this over parameterization, the two things are very important. So the first is you want to, uh, so you want to parameterize your model You still want to parameterize your model properly, even if uh, they have a much more parameters than the training example. For example, you don't want to use an over-parameterized linear regression model to do image net. You still want to use neural network for image net, although uh, it has the neural network, uh, even I over-parameterize a linear model, it can also fit all the training examples in the, in the image net. But actually, if I over-parameterize a linear model and I train it, it will get a nonsense solution. But if I over parameterize a, a neural net, then it will get a very reasonable solution. So still want to parameterize the model properly in the over parameterization setting. But and also the other very important thing is the optimization algorithm actually matters here. which is uh, ignored from the traditional empirical risk minimization process. So in the traditional, uh, uh, in the previous one, uh, if you just have uh, any empirical risk minimizer, if you under parameterize the model, like if you have more data than the training example, uh, then, then the capacity of the model and if you just get any empirical risk minimizer, you are going to have a good generalization. But in this new way, the optimization algorithm actually plays a very important role here. Uh, as I said in the linear model, uh, it's not that all, any empirical risk minimizer has a good generalization. It's an empirical risk minimizer that finds by a specific optimization algorithm that will give you the generalization in the over parameterization model. So, and usually there are two things that make the optimization work. The first one is you, you need to choose a proper optimization algorithm. For example, it's an ER, empirical risk minimizer fine by gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent process from some reasonable random initialization, not just uh, any uh, empirical risk minimizer at uh, 
given by some arbitrary algorithm. So it's this optimization algorithm actually plays a very important role. Uh, yeah, so that's why I'm very interested in over parameterization. It kind of like uh, playing an uh, intermediate step between how to do model it and how to optimize. So it's uh, this two part combined together, it gives us a, a very good result. So now let, let's me, let me give a, a example of uh, over parameterization in practice that shows how the optimization matters and how the modeling matters. So here is one example. Uh, the example is very simple. You just have uh, two two layer neural network. Uh, so you have a output layer and you have one hidden layer. And then you have the input layer. So this one is a fully connected layer. So it's, uh, it's connect to everything. And I'm going to put a ReLU activation function here. And all the upper levels are just a simple one. Uh, upper weight are just simple one. And I'm just uh, interested in like the inner weight for this model. So let us, uh, to illustrate the power of uh, over parameterization and the power of optimization, so let us consider our, uh, let us consider, uh, so let us consider the uh, generative model for the data. So we assume that our label y uh, of a given, so let's call the input x and the output y here. So for, for a given x, the y is actually given by a fixed function which is some i equal to d. So I have, a, let's say, d hidden unit here, and also the input dimension is also d. So let us assume that the output layer is just a, a it's also the generative model is also a, a, also a two layer neural net. So I can find an empirical risk minimizer with zero training error. Uh, so the general, the model is just, uh, there is this some ground truth weight W star, so that the uh, label Y of X is equal to the summation of the ReLU of WI, the inner product between WI and X. So my labels are generated from, yeah, by this process. So of course, if I set uh, each weight WI to be WI star in this thing, then it will give me zero training, zero error, even zero training error and zero test error. So now let's consider two ways of, uh, uh, also I just assume X is very simple. It's just a sample from no, normal Gaussian distribution. So it's a simplest setting. So now let's consider two ways of training this uh, uh, model. The first one is under parameterization, which is uh, uh, I just want to minimize uh, summation of j. So I get a data point x1 up to xj with labels y1 up to yj. Uh, sorry, uh, data point x1 up to xm and label y1 up to ym. So Let's consider the first way of training this model, which is uh, under parameterization way. So you just want to minimize the summation over j equal to one up to m, the square loss of y, yj minus uh, the summation of i equal to one up to d, the inner product between wi and xj. 
OK? So you have this uh, properly parameterized model. If you just fit in wi as wi star, then you will be able to have a zero training error and zero generalization error. But what we find in practice is that if you do gradient design of this uh, objective function starting from random initialization, it actually actually stuck. So it's stuck in a very strong sense is that even wi star are orthogonal. So for example, wi star is just a, uh, it's a basis vector. And uh, I start from wi, which is a random initialization. So gradient design process still gets stuck. I stuck at a very bad uh, local minimal, so it's not moving anymore uh, in this uh, proper generalization, in this properly parameterized setting. So the ERM process is actually very difficult. Uh, But I can also have another way to train the model, which is I will use an over-parameterization way to train it. So I will use the summation of j equal to 1 up to m, uh, so also the yi minus. But now I replace this function by something that has a much more number of wi than the training example. So I can have i up to 1 up to n of the ReLU of wi times xj square. So this n uh, times the dimension is much larger than m. So n is the total number of wi, and so, the di so n times the dimension is like the total number of parameters. So my total number of parameters is much larger than my total number of training example. And if I minimize this thing, so in practice, the gradient design starting from a small random initialization it will actually converge to zero error. So it's not going to stack at a local optimal. It will find the global optimal. Yes? So what do you mean by small? Uh, small is like much. So you want the total Fubini norm of the weight matrix to so be. just like small w's. Yeah, yeah small w's. So it will converge to zero arrow, and surprisingly, it doesn't overfit. So uh, the experiment results suggest that if you have M to be something like uh, something like D over epsilon square or something proportional to the weight of w i star over epsilon square, then you will going to have epsilon generalization error. No matter how big n is. OK, so. Even if you over parameterize the model and you can fit anything, you can even find wi with some very non reasonable in some non reasonable position. Uh, but so that you have no generalization at all. But if you train it using gradient design or stochastic gradient design, then you will convert to something with zero error. 
and you will converge to a point that has generalization. It will not overfit your model. So it's a uh, completely, so it's like in this setting, you kind of get the good of both. So your empirical risk minimization process is going to be much easier, and you still have a very good generalization. So this kind of model is very widely used in new in the machine learning nowadays uh, in training neural network. And this surprisingly, it can get the good of both. Uh, it can, the training is easier and the generalization is actually better. So here then is that small random initialization very crucial? Yeah, it's very crucial. But if you have a very huge random initialization, then it still gets uh, stuck. Yeah, but then you're basically saying that you'll restrict to a smaller space, right? Although you have more parameters. Uh, no, Since but you, you do gradient descent, so you can go to some point. You can, okay. But yeah, but uh, the point is gradient descent will not explore that space. Yeah, That's yeah. very crucial, yeah. yeah. But then it is sort of like saying, okay, yeah. Yeah, but if you, but think of this setting, you also have a small parameter space, but still gradient descent stack. Uh, in that setting, you have a small, some, your initialization is in a small space, but the gradient descent, will find a very good minimizer and still it will not overfit. So it's a gradient design will go a long way to find the minimizer, but it will avoid the, the bad uh, global minimals. Yes, yes? Do you know any more efficient optimization algorithm other than stochastic gradient design, which will actually convert to some bad, uh, bad local minimums or bad uh, I don't know that, but uh, I can definitely come up with some bad location. <laughs> but I don't know which algorithm will convert to that. Okay. You can, yeah. Okay. You can you can you can construct that. Uh, right. Places. But... Right. It... Okay. I don't know, to, yes. To verify that the uh, small initialization. So I think it's the same as what people use in practice. Just uh, one over the root of the. Yeah. So if they want the spectral norm of the entire matrix to be bounded by some. It's really yeah. the practical. Practic yeah, it's a really practical initialization. So that also explains why they use small initialization in practice for these models. Uh, not explain, but uh, experimentally verify. So. So the success of the over-parameterization actually uh, bring a very huge challenge in uh, theoretical machine learning, which is why the model actually generalized. Another question. Yes? For, for ReLU, of course, it's non-differentiable. We, yes. we solve it. But uh, assume you use some differentiable replacement for ReLU, like yes. mostly, and then you can use kind of Cos Newton or even Newton. Yes. In that case, would that be a bad opposition algorithm compared with gradient descent? Uh, I we didn't try that. Maybe it's a good point that we uh, we can try that whether that optimization algorithm is bad than gradient descent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but we didn't. Like yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Not really gradient descent. Right. Exactly. Will explore the curvature, for example, your, your, your cost function. Right. Differently than right. Uh, that's also a very interesting comment. Like, if there is a practical algorithm that works in good in convex setting, but it will not uh, give a good generalization in this setting. Yeah, we haven't tried that yet. You said then this over parameterization, like the algorithm which you use to optimize, plays a big role. Yeah. So it's somehow counterintuitive to me because it shouldn't be the algorithm, it should be some property of the solution which should be. Uh, like right. Can I, can I say that? Like, okay, I will over parameterize, but I will try to find the solution which there may be now multiple solutions for this, maybe even infinite, but I will try to find a solution with sparsest uh, support or something. Right, That's, but then your optimization is harder. If you yeah, sure. stay in a constraint site. Sure, sure. I'm not talking about like what algorithm I will use, but if can you abstract and say that if you find a sparse solution, then it will be good. It will yeah, be good. Uh, yeah, definitely you can say that. For example, in this model, you can say that if I can find a solution such that the summation of the norm of WI 
is smaller or equal to the summation of the norm of Wi star, then it's good. Yeah, you can definitely say that, but there is no guarantee that the gradient design will no, output. Yeah, that is yeah. Fine, but... And also, if you constrain to be inside this site, then it's actually much harder to optimize because you need to do projections and other things like, and the ERM. So basically, the optimization step will actually step outside this site and then go back. So it's a very interesting behavior. I mean, I'm just trying to separate computational <coughs> part with, in, like, in sort of like. Yeah. So the thing. key point is like, there there are two ways to view this uh, thing. The first is maybe the uh, over parameterization is just a, a optimization over some constraint side, but implicitly, yeah. So the new the point of my talk is exactly this. So the gradient design point place that uh, as a view of uh, optimization over a constraint set, but it's uh, not written in the optimization process. But it's actually doing that. Uh, yeah, so, so over parameterization actually create a new challenge for, theor for theoretical machine learning because the, class the uh, classical VC theory or other things does not apply to this setting at all. So you need to, in order to analyze over parameterization as a whole, you need to consider the algorithm that gets you to the empirical risk minimizer. Instead of just saying, I have any empirical risk minimizer, then it's good. Okay. So my talk, uh, in this talk, I will demonstrate the uh, over parameterization through a simpler example than the neural net which is called the matrix sensing. So in matrix sensing, the problem is just to find a hidden, to find, yes? But uh, can you prove something for this, uh, for this two-layer example, actually? Uh, we can prove that the optimization works. This, uh, this, is, uh, this can be proved, but the generalization is pretty hard. I see, so it's still open. Yeah, it's still open. Who are we? It's just myself. I guess there are also re uh, related papers who prove that over parameterization for two layer neural net can help generalization. There are several papers along this line. So it's a, the optimization part, uh, sorry, can help optimization. So the optimization of this thing is, is kind of like not very misery to us for the over parameterization model because you have so many parameters, it's uh, even possible to remember all your input example and just uh, to do some kind of threshold thing or, yeah, so the optimization is not that difficult to show, but the generalization is very difficult. So, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, over parameterization behavior through the example of matrix sensing, which is you want to find the hidden matrix. Uh, let's for simple assume is PSD X star through linear measurements. So uh, in formula, it just says I'm given a set of design matrix uh, AI high from uh, one up to M. Let's say it's a uh, X star is belongs to our D times D and this PIC, so it's square, should be D times D. Uh, and I'm given this, a set of design matrix and I'm also given the inner product of AI and X uh, X star. So the so the goal is to recover uh, X star. Of course, you can add some noise to this thing, and you can also have 
recover guarantee with respect to how large noise you, uh, you add. But for this talk, let's just focus on the simple setting where there is no noise. So it's, the problem is just that this simple one that you are given a set of design matrix AI, and you also given the linear measurements, which is the inner product of AI and X star. And then you just find to find X star. So usually, uh, these AIs are drawn from Gaussian matrices uh, over the matrices. So there are each coordinates are IID Gaussian random variable. And all the AIs are also independent. So they're just a Gaussian, completely independent Gaussian random matrix. Sorry, so what is this notation? AI are matrices. Uh, yeah, so AI are matrices in RD times D. So the inner product. It's just equal to trace of AI transpose times X star. It's just uh, And what do you want to minimize? Uh, no, you want to find X star. So this is a problem. I'm not saying about the optimization yet. Okay. This is a problem of matrix sensing, which is uh, you recover the hidden matrix X star from the linear measurements. This is a problem. I haven't defined the optimization yet. So. Uh, so in order to solve this problem, there is a, uh, in order to solve this problem, there is a, yeah, this is just a problem. So in order to solve this problem, so let's assume that X star is belongs to its rank car. And the classical uh, or the old theorem uh, says that if you have m equal to order of dr, then you can recover exactly. Okay, so the x is a rank r, uh, rank r matrix, so essentially the hidden capacity of x star is order of dimension times rank. This just says if I have more data than the hidden dimension of X star, then I can recover X star. So how do you recover it? You can, this is a paper by Nati et al. So you can actually recover it using the under parameterization optimization problem, which is you just minimize uh, summation of AI, AI X star minus AI times U, U transpose square. Minimize over all the matrices U that belongs to R times D times R. So you just minimize the empirical risk. You just minimize the empirical risk of the AI times X star to, your, to the prediction. Of your of your model, so you you build a model that has uh, d times r parameters, and then you want to use this model to predict the uh, measurements, and you use the square law to measure the performance, and if you minimize this uh, using gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, anyway like that, then you can recover x star. So u u transpose will be equal to x star after. Uh, sorry, UU transpose minus X star, the two norm will be smaller or equal to epsilon, or the Fubini norm will be smaller than epsilon after poly uh, dimension and one or epsilon iterations. Okay, so if you minimize this objective function using gradient descent, then the Generalization error, which is how UU star is close to X star, will be smaller than epsilon using uh, polynomial in D and one or epsilon many iterations. So this is a, a theorem by Nati et al. that says that if I properly parameterize a model that has the same parameter as a hidden thing, then if I have more samples, something like D times R samples, then the uh, actually, 
this should be an omega. So I have more, more samples than my capacity of the model. Then I can recover the ground truth. OK, so it's very good. Does it work for the noisy case as well? Yeah, it works for the noisy case. You have uh, something that has a noise in it. Can I use this as some sort of generalization of compressance and kind of thing? Uh, yeah, it is. So because AI is a, a random Gaussian matrix, right. so. What is the properties of AI you need? I mean, uh, it's a restricted uh, isotrope. isotrope. Yeah, yeah. So now in this work, so what we show is that we're still doing this optimization procedure. So we want to minimize, but but now we minimize over U that has full rank. So it's not a, it's not a under, it's not a proper model anymore. So I, I model my uh, hidden, um, I model my hypothesis as all the matrices that has full, uh, all the matrices in R D times D, and then I want to minimize this objective, and of course, uh, if you just have an arbitrary minimizer of this thing then it will not generalize at all. Because you can just set UU transpose to be x star plus anything x delta, such that the inner product of AI and x delta is equal to 0. And since I only have uh, flow I in M, so since M is still uh, just uh, maybe, let's say, theta of d times r, in this setting, m is theta of d times r, which is much smaller than d squared. So I'm going to find a lot of x delta that has this property. So ai times x delta is equal to 0 for all the i. OK? And I just put uu transpose to be x star plus x delta, then there is no generalization, although it's an empirical risk minimizer. Now what we show is that if we do gradient design, gradient design from uh, u is equal to some alpha times identity where alpha is smaller uh, than epsilon over poly d. OK, so you do gradient design on this objective function, not just uh, find any empirical risk minimizer. Then, uh, after, so u uh, from u0, then u u transpose minus x star, the Fubini swarm will be smaller or equal to epsilon in uh, polylog d times log 1 over epsilon iterations. OK, so you can see that the, the whole thing just says that we can get epsilon accuracy after some polynomial in dimension and polynomial in one or epsilon iteration. But if you do over parameterization, the optimization is actually much easier. So you can convert to something smaller than epsilon in just a polylog of dimension and times log one or epsilon iterations. Then you so it has a linear convergence as opposite to so an underparameterized model, which has a, a something like one or epsilon, poly one or epsilon convergence. And also it's, it's generalized because the measurement is the Fubini swarm between UU star minus X, UU transpose minus X star instead of uh, just the empirical risk. So you will convert to a very epsilon generalization arrow in uh, in a linear rate. 
So where is the over parameterization in this formulation? So u is the full matrix. It's oh. from Rd times D. So you can have x star plus x u tie, anything like that. Oh, there, there u is the, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's the same rank as x star. I'm, I'm surprised that the, so where does R appear in the, in the theorem? Uh, so I'm so you have to have uh, enough samples, that's all. That's right, but the number of yeah. samples remains the same, right? Uh, it's not exactly the same. So <coughs> this one requires M to be something like theta D times some poly R. I guess it's uh, something like R square. All right, so it's uh, slightly worse than that. But still, uh, you can have uh, a lot of... Uh, so, so, so this bound, are you hiding in your logs? Is it like literally D times R, or it's like some polylog of things? Uh, uh, so, so, so for example, on the left board... Uh, this one is literally D times R, there's no for log. For noisy case? Uh, so for noisy case, I guess you have to have something that depends on the noise level. In noisy less case, it's literally D times R. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so this is uh, this is our work, and what is the message? It's the first one. It's the parameterization matters. So why do I say the parameterization matters? Because why here I put U U transpose since it's a matrix of full dimension. So in the under parameterization model, I have to put UU transpose because I want to restrict my search space to be of rank R. But here, anyway, I'm searching as a low, as a, a full dimension space. So why not just put an X here and then minimize over X? Belongs to R times D times D. So I can just do this and it will give me the same searching space. So the point is, if you want to minimize this, it actually doesn't work. So you can start with arbitrarily small initialization, you use arbitrarily small learning rate, it still gets stuck. So it's not getting stuck, it will have zero error, but there is no generalization. It is. Generalization, you mean that's just the matrix reconstruction error? Yeah, reconstruction error, not, yeah. Not the uh, observation uh, It's also the observation, because if you have a new AI, yeah, 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 you, only, only the, yeah, yeah it's even the reconstruction error. Even if it stays in this like positive semi-definite cone. Yeah, so even if it stays as a positive. Because majorly, it's natural to parameterize UU transpose, but. Uh, yeah, so maybe you can. So yeah. PSD cone will not work? It will not work. Because so. implicitly in that one, when you op uh, work with the UU transpose, you always get a PSD kind of a construction. Here, yeah. You need to add a projectile out of PSD. That one. Uh, so basically, because the gradient design update is different, so if you think of the gradient of this guy is something times u, yeah. but the gradient of this guy is just uh, something yeah. without much. But when you do a PSD projection, then that will change things. Uh, right. Because if you, if you do, a, for example, if you use gradient design style, you compute a gradient and then do, and then, like uh, Ilya said, if you do a PSD projection, then that will change things, because that will somehow get into a structure of this. Uh, uh, exactly, but uh, so let's us, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what is the answer of your question, but if you replace AI by symmetric, uh, by like uh, Gaussian, uh, like v sharp matrix, which is uh, Gaussian times its transpose, which is a symmetric matrix, 
then the whole thing is still work, and you can show that the gradient of this thing is always is uh, essentially always PIC. So you will always stay in the PIC cone. So you don't need to do projection, but still it uh, doesn't work. So when you say it doesn't work, you can prove this, or is this an empirical? It's statement? an empirical statement. Okay. Yeah. You don't, you don't know why it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, we don't have a very good idea why it doesn't work. But I guess if you want to prove it doesn't work, then you can still write down the update and see what is happening. But we didn't do that because uh, empirically it doesn't work. So it's a good sign that the parameterization, yes? I think I got a bit confused. In this formulation, you don't have any low rank constraint? Uh, this formulation, no. Yeah. And also this formulation, you don't have low rank constraint. Oh, either. No, it's yeah, it's d by d, not d by r. So you don't have low run constraint. Well, then the question is, once you do that, using without low rank d by d, will you get a low rank solution or not? Of course, you'll you get a low rank solution because you're close to x star. x star is low rank. Okay, you get a low rank. Yeah. It's very, yeah. It's very mysterious, actually. Yeah. Like, why? So the parameterization actually matters a lot. You have to do this parameterization instead of this parameterization in order to make the over parameterization work. Oh, you get the low rank solution, but would you itself be low rank? Or has to be? It has to be because, uh, yeah, well, you're yeah. You can be full rank, but you're close to, but. You're close to uh, low rank. It has to be yeah. close to you. Yeah. But, I mean, not only you are saying, that over parameterization matters. It's a specific way of over parameterization. Yeah, that's why, that's right. what I'm saying. It's parameterization in over parameterization matters. It's a specific way of over parameterization matters. So are you going to tell us some intuition or the proof or? Uh, we are going to see something about the proof. Yeah. So also the gradient design matters in the empirical risk minimization. So it's not an arbitrary empirical risk minimizer. It's a one getting by gradient design. And the third thing is initialization matters. So we initialize u0 to be something like alpha times identity, where alpha is something very small. If you don't initialize it to be that, you initialize it to be identity, then it will not generalize. So you will have a very bad generalization error. So the initialization also plays a very small initialization also plays a very important role. Okay, so the first thing is over parameterization can help training. Yes. I mean, you've, you've solved this problem very nicely, and you can show that your solution works. But do you have, like, so, so you said, all right, it super matters that I have parameterized in this way and not this other way, which seems more obvious. It would be the one I would pick first. Yeah. Um, do you have some intuition, and it super matters that I start at this point, not some other randomly chosen point. Do you have some intuition about why I should choose those things and, like, how to choose in other scenarios in a way that would make this work? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I guess uh, I guess this is just a one, uh, uh, one example about why our parameterization work in this setting. If you want to move to other settings, then probably there are different criteria. No, no, yeah. no, I'm sure there would be different criteria. I just was curious if you had a sense of like things like this. I guess a small initialization is always very crucial. Okay. You right. don't I mean, want to start. Left out too, because it seems like gradient descent is always the answer. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so a small initialization is also very crucial, okay. and the parameterization is uh, more like uh, magic. So right. in neural net, it's I mean, there are some structure left. better than the other, but we don't know why. So okay. people can get millions of dollars for intuition <laughs> of. Uh, how to choose a proper structure. Then you should tell us some intuitions. No, I don't have intuition. So or the first message is over parameterization helps training. Uh, yeah. 
for this part, uh, we can also show it for neural net, even more than two layers. The over parameterization can help training. Uh, if you are interested in that, we can talk about it later. So these are the messages for this work. Uh, so let's us. Uh, yes? I, I guess one more question. Yeah, um, maybe we can, uh, because oh, we're an hour in, yeah, yeah, and okay. we maybe want to you know, wrap up in a reasonable time. Maybe let's save the questions until the end. Uh, so what's, what's your plan? How much longer do you think you have? Uh... Uh, depending on, I guess I can just give a very short proof. Yeah. Like, okay. Let's try to give maybe 10 more minutes and then kind of sum it up. Okay. And then maybe open it up to questions. So let's just uh, do the short proof for r, for r equal to 1. So you just have a dimension one hidden matrix, and you have like a linear in D many samples. That's a setting. So basically, the 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 key idea is you want to show that the gradient descent stays at the low rank manifold. Although there is no incentive, although there is no explicit uh, regularization saying that the gradient design should only stay in low rank manifold. But if you just do gradient design in that objective function, it will naturally stay on the low rank manifold while maintaining the optimization properly or anything. So if the gradient design stays at a low rank manifold of rank one, if we have this guarantee, then if we don't care about the running time here, then we can actually use the result of uh, Nati at all to show that it actually converge. But still, our proof are uh, slightly different because we get an even faster convergence rate. So it's not a, a replication of that result. So how do we say that something stays at a low rank manifold? It's very simple. So how do we say that a matrix is low rank or just uh, essentially rank one? It's just uh, the sigma. So I write UU transpose as the SVD, which is, is equal to some orthogonal matrix times some diagonal matrix times V transpose. So this is the SVD thing of that. And I want to show that, so the sigma is equal to some diagonal matrix of sigma one up to sigma d, and sigma one is bigger than sigma two, and bigger or equal than up to sigma d, bigger or equal to zero. So how do we say that uh, UU transpose is a low rank? It's just very simple, you want to maintain that Sigma two is always small. Okay, if you have, if you can maintain this property for a very long time through the gradient descent process, then you know that the gradient descent will only search through the low rank manifold, and then you can show that it converge. So, but you have to maintain this property for very long if you want uh, want to use Nati's result, you have to maintain it for like poly D and log and one or epsilon many iterations. You'll say that in that many iterations, uh, it has to, so the, the sigma two is always small. Uh, but so, But usually maintaining the second largest singular value can be extremely difficult because the singular value is a very special uh, algebraic structure that you don't really have a very good formula to say how does it change if I update the matrix a little bit. So what we do is something slightly different. So we always decompose UU transpose into something like a low rank matrix which is U times U transpose plus a full matrix 
let's call it E. And so UU transpose, uh, it looks like a singular value decomposition in the sense that U transpose times E is actually equal to zero. So one way of thinking this is that uh, U is the first uh, singular vector, and then E is the uh, E is a matrix consists of the rest of singular vectors, so you have this property for free. But what we do is like uh, we only we only maintain uh, so we only maintain this decomposition, but we don't say that U is exactly the top singular vector. Okay? And then what we want to say is that the spectral norm of E is small. By small I mean it stays at epsilon uh, in order so stay as epsilon over some poly D, like that. And of course, for initialization, since U is alpha times identity, uh, so I can just uh, pick U to be anything and E to be anything else in the orthogonal span, and this property is true. And I want to show that this is true through the entire gradient descent process until it converges. Okay. So what we actually do is uh, we decompose this ut for iteration t. We decompose it into the projection uh, identity minus some st, st transpose, where st has norm 2, has norm 1, times ut plus st, st transpose times ut. OK? So we should think of this as the arrow matrix, and this is the rank one matrix. So I see it's a vector that is changing over time. Okay, so we maintain this decomposition, and we want to say that the spectral norm of E is small, and then this thing will convert to uh, the X star thing. So but before getting into it, so of course the crucial thing is how do we choose the IC for the low rank subspace for the projection thing. So since X star is rank one, hmm. so since X star is rank one, A good guess is, uh, I just uh, say x star is equal to some x, x transpose. For it's a rank one matrix, so I can pick that. So a good guess is I just pick st to be equal to x. So I always look at uh, my decomposition as the projection to or x divided by the two norm of x. So I always look at the projection through the ground truth direction and the projection to the other direction. This is one good guess, and it actually won't work. So why this uh, decomposition? So why does uh, looking at uh, fixed uh, decomposition? So I decompose into a ground truth part and the not ground truth part won't work. Uh, it's very simple. So let's say we, our U, U transpose our u is just uh, equal to a half times x, okay? I start from a very good point, which is uh, almost x, but just off by a scaling factor. So what is a gradient? So what is a gradient? So gradient is just going to be equal to, if you do the calculation a little bit, so the negative gradient is going to be ai times xx transpose is going to be proportional to ai times x, x transpose times ai times x. Uh, sorry, u is a full rank matrix, so u should be this. So let's uh, maybe just assume the norm of x is 1 for simplicity. So u is a, uh, yeah, uh, U itself is a rank one matrix. It's very close to X star, but just uh, uh, U transpose is very close to X star, but just uh, off by a factor. So even I have, I'm at this very good point, and I do one gradient descent step. 
So the negative gradient will be proportional to AI times XS transpose times AI times XS transpose. And this is very easy to see because I have AI times X star minus AI times UU transpose uh, square. And I do the gradient, I will get this in, then multiplied by AI and then multiplied by one U. So it's just uh, this one. Uh, because UU transpose is some scaling of X star, so I get this in. But the point is, this gradient uh, is not going to be something in the, in the span of X star anymore. So if you look at this part, it will be in the X star. So it's, the gradient will going to be a rank one thing multiplied by this. So this part is going to be X transpose, which is uh, the same as X star. But uh, this thing, because I only have order of D times R samples, so it's not exactly going to be X. If I have infinite samples, so I take the expectation over AI, then it will going to be X. But I have finite samples, so this will not be X. It will off by a constant factor. So it will off by a constant factor, but if I still maintain the low rank part as everything that is inside X, then I will going to have a constant factor in the arrow. So the arrow, of course, will not stay at epsilon. It will stay at uh, the learning rate times some constant. And if you just do one word, the learning rate iteration, it will be constant arrow. So there is no hope. So it's important to choose xt to be some changing basis. And Uh, probably I will not have a, a very succinct way to explain what is a good changing basis, but you can see it's necessary to maintain the decomposition with a changing basis instead of a fixed one, even if the fixed one is a ground truth one. And even the ground truth one doesn't work, of course, other fixed one is probably not very good. So, uh, so what we actually do is we maintain the ST as itself an update. So we will pick ST plus one is equal to some uh, identity minus some eta times some matrix times ST and then normalize. So it, ST itself is uh, like a power update of itself, but the update is by a non-fixed matrix. And what is this non-fixed matrix? It's actually equal to the gradient. X star minus UU transpose. I think it's a plus. Times U. Okay, so eta is the learning rate of the gradient design. So I will pick xt as uh, some update according to the gradient design formula itself. So it's a power method with a non-fixed matrix. And the non-fixed matrix actually come from the gradient. So I don't know what is this matrix. I don't have an explicit solution, but I can always maintain xt as this. And if you maintain this structure, then uh, if you do the calculation, which is um, not very, uh, clean, but uh, still, uh, you can show that the arrow actually grow in a very small rate. Okay, so this is like the proof idea for rank one case and for high rank case is uh, even much harder because uh, for high rank case, you have to project on a high rank matrix. So a rank R matrix as a projection and you also have to decompose this guy into some other structure. So, but you can see from here, what is the idea of the proof is, you want to maintain that the gradient design stay at a low rank manifold. And the way you maintain it is you decompose the matrix into this uh, structural form, into this structural form, and you pick a cleverly pick a basis and do that, okay? 
So I guess that's the end of my talk. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, is there any question? Yes? Uh, can you give a hint on how you got this uh, polylog log or epsilon improvement? Uh, this, this looks like not much different if you maintain a rank one. You know, in the original rank one, you also maintain rank one. Uh, right, but uh, the point is, so uh, the reason that the gradient design is very slow is that if you start from a rank one solution, so start from U, start from a rank one solution, then U itself is not, so then, then if you do this decomposition, uh, the, the rank one position of U is actually very large, but the ground truth position X is actually very small because think of U as being a random rank one solution, then it will only have a very small weight on the ground truth solution, but it's actually very close to a rank one matrix it's actually a rank one matrix, but it's not close to the ground truth at all. But if you have u equal to alpha times identity, it will treat every direction equally. So the ground truth direction has the equal weight with all the other rank one solution. But if you do the low rank uh, update, the initial step, the ground truth solution direction has a much lower weight than the rank the random rank one solution. So initially you will go through this random rank one di direction for a, a long step and then you go back. But for this, every direction is equal, so it has a faster convergence. Yeah. So if you choose your initialization to be some random and pierce the uh, sm uh, small matrices, will your, so will the convergence still true, but the converge rate will be uh, yeah, next, um, uh, um, slower, like the original theory. Uh, I guess if you choose a random matrix, then it's... Just uh, small u times uh, u transpose, but u is a, a, a random vector. Yeah, I guess it will be slower in the sense that if you have a random matrix, then the top eigenvalue is actually um, larger than the... Uh, well, in, in some probability, the top eigenvalue will be much larger than the weight of uh, the ground truth. Then it will make the convergence uh, slightly slower. But still, it will generalize. Yeah, it will still generalize. Okay, so the short is that basically, when you initialize this, you use the property of the power method. When, you have, when your uh, uh, intended vector is kind of a dominant or a significant, then the power method will kick in, will make you much convergence much faster. Is that the, the basic idea? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay, let's take the speaker one more time.